So in this lecture, I'm going to discuss distribution circuit power flow. We've been using this during this course, you know, through the, the examples in the in the windmill program. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the mechanism by which we would actually do these voltage drop calculations. Before I get into the subject matter, though, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we used to do this type of analysis before we had computers. And that was done through using what's called a network analyzer. And if you look at an early edition of William Stevenson's textbook, the kind of a famous book on power system analysis, uh, they've got some pictures in there that, that show a, a network analyzer. And in this particular case, what you see on the right is you show a, a piece of transmission for North Carolina. It was actually simulated in this example in his, in his textbook. On the left, you actually see the network analyzer itself. And the way this would work is it's a scale down analog circuit. So imagine that instead of working at 7,200 volts like you would with the primary, what you would do is you would scale all the voltages down to something manageable, maybe be like 120 volts or 12 volts AC. And then what you would do is you would scale uh, all the line impedances and all the transformer impedances, et cetera, so that when you got a value for current uh, based on this 12 or 120 volt AC source, that if you would apply a scaling factor to it, then it would correspond to the current you would have on the real system. And so in order to do something like this, what you'd have to have for each transmission line segment is you'd have to have a way of setting an equivalent resistance and reactance for the line. And that's what you see here on this board is if you look at this board, you, you basically see a bunch of dials on there. And if you look at a little bit of a close-up of a line module, you can see that you could set the line resistance and you can set the line reactance. And so if you've had a circuit slab before, you might have looked at one of these decade resistance boxes where you can dial in any type of resistance you want to. Well, you do the same thing here. Uh, and then you could, you could have this switched in or out of the circuit. And basically, this is what we had in, in the 50s and parts of the 60s to do these transmission system calculations. We didn't even bother to do this, <clears throat> excuse me, with, with distribution at that time. We were still using things like K factors, but in the days where we wanted to get voltages and power flow values for transmission using simulation, this is the approach that was taken. And so in the first edition of Stevenson's book, which came out in 1955, this is what they talked about. This is before we had power flow. So when computers were first developed in the late 50s, then you had various um, professors start to work out the algorithms and people in industry were working on this too. And this is when the, the power flow that we work with today actually got developed is on some of these early computers. Uh, this shows a picture from Stevenson's second edition, which came out in 1962, which showed uh, an early computer system, in this case, an IBM mainframe system. And so this is where we had magnetic core for the, the memory. We had tape drives. We had um, the programs punched onto 80 column cards. Uh, you'd have to basically punch these cards out, put them into a card reader. Um, that was the technology we had back then. And so utilities started using these types of programs for transmission studies in the 60s. And it wasn't really until the personal computer became popular in the 80s that we transitioned from this running on mainframes. Uh, as we'll describe later on, the use of a power flow for distribution didn't even really become popular until like the, the 90s. Um, so, so anyway, just, just gives you a little bit of historical perspective of where we actually started out as, as far as doing some of these network calculations. Where we're kind of headed toward now is we're headed toward doing these hybrid simulations of transmission in conjunction with distribution. Where at the distribution level, we, we would want to be doing things like modeling the integration of photovoltaic systems or other sort of inverter-based devices like battery energy storage devices, maybe even microgrids. And so this shows an example of a project that NC State's involved in. We're using a simulation system made by a company called OpalRT. 
basically what this is doing is taking a Simulink model and you can compile this and you can run this in real time. So if I were gonna hook a relay up to this, I'd be able to send signals into a relay in real time to emulate what's going on in, on the real system. And so this shows where you would have a, a interconnected power system model um, for transmission. You could have some control algorithms or some monitoring running. You could link in a, a simulation of a, of a distribution feeder like we're focused on in this class. And then if you even want to take it all the way down to the controls used for PV inverters or other types of inverters, you could model that as well and you can tie all this together. In this case, these linkages are, are very fast links through a computer network. Think about using like fiber optics to link all these different systems together. Um, but, but anyway, this is kind of where we're headed as we're kind of headed toward this integrated simulation. So we're sort of focused on the distribution feeder, you know, kind of running static studies right now. But there's a lot of work going on in, in terms of doing what we're doing now with Windmill um, to, to have this run in real time. So what I'll be focusing on in this lecture is the kind of more of a focus on distribution circuit power flow. And so the first part of the video segment is I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about what the power flow does in case you're not familiar with it. So some of the history and go and talk through some of the circuit data that's used to drive this power flow program for distribution. Something else I also need to mention is how we come up with these load values and distribution is different than transmissions. We have to go through a different technique to come up with the, the various uh, load calculated values that would go into this program. Then in the second part, in part B, I'll introduce the power flow. I'll, I'll kind of link this to what you might have seen for transmission studies in a class like 451. And we'll just focus on one segment. You know, how would we run a power flow on one segment? And what's going to be the impact if we had a uh, transpose versus non-transpose distribution lines? And then we'll extend this to multiple segments, which is what we need for doing larger systems, which we'll be talking more about next week. And then I'll just show you a quick example of what this would look like in Windmill. So what's a power flow? Well, it's, it's basically a program that we're gonna use for calculating not only bus voltages, but other parameters associated with the operation of a, of a circuit. And so, it, this would be like the bus voltages that we would have at different points in the circuit. We would also want to calculate what are the flow values like real and reactive power. We would want to calculate the, the current magnitudes because that relates to capacity. We would calculate the I squared R type of losses as well. All those different things could be calculated in a power flow program. And what we have to have as input are the various things we've kind of already talked about as far as the transformer and the overhead and the cable models is we need to have that raw parameter information so we can get the impedances. So we need have the values of, uh, for the conductors and the, and the spacing for overhead. We need to have the same spacing and conductor information for cables. We have to have the transformer per unit values. This all feeds into the model that we're going to use for power flow. Other sorts of things we would have is information about the line voltage regulation, which we talked about in a previous lecture, and capacitor bank locations, whether they're fixed or switch, which we'll talk about in a future lecture. We also need to have customer load data. And since we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, have a lot of points on a distribution circuit, um, you know, this is a lot of data that we have to actually manipulate. And then the last thing we need to have is we need to have what we call topology. That is, if I have a substation and if I have a feeder coming out of the substation, then how are all these different feeder segments interconnected together? And so this interconnection is what we refer to as the topology of the circuit. So once we have all this information, then the final piece we need is we need to have information about measurements. We would have to know perhaps what's the top of feeder measurements, which we can get through having a relay. 
we would have to have some information about the loads. And there's a variety of different data sources, such as kilowatt hour billing information. Maybe we have transformer KVA sizes. Maybe we have smart meter data for all these customer locations out in the field. Uh, depending on what we have, then we're going to go through and we're going to do um, different types of manipulations of data to come up with the load model. So I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit before, but I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically um, um, about distribution, where, where we kind of come from and where we're headed on this. And as I mentioned before, the first computer codes for power flow were worked out in the late 50s. As you can imagine, uh, computers there were kind of in their infancy. These weren't very sophisticated programs. So they couldn't really run very large circuits. Um, initially, the focus was on transmission. And so if you think about a lot of these distribution circuits that were developed in the 50s and 60s, 70s, maybe even the 80s, those were really developed without the aid of computer programs for doing power flow. So this K factor I talked about was the tool that we would use at that time. It wasn't really feasible to model distribution using these network analyzers. And so distribution planners had a very variety of different um, approximation techniques for kind of estimating what to expect for voltage drops on the circuits. The cost for running these first power flow programs is really high because initially utilities didn't even own their own computers. They had to go to service centers. So maybe you know, like Chicago or New York or big cities would have mainframe computers and utilities would have to send their, have to fly their engineers to these different centers to run their, their power flows. And the other thing which was uh, a hindrance is we couldn't really run large scale system studies early on because computer memory and processing power was relatively expensive. And so we were always working with kind of reduced system models. We couldn't make these models too complex. What was a kind of a game changer was the introduction of personal computers in the 80s, uh, especially the standardization around the IBM PC design. And so what this made possible would, was the development of computer programs where instead of having these targeted mainframes, these were targeted to running on these personal computers. And what you would have seen then if, if you were you know, working back at this time is that you know, we had people maybe working up some of their own codes around the 80s, maybe utility would write, write their own power flow program, or maybe an individual engineer even in a utility might write their own codes. However, the commercial companies started introducing their products in the 90s, which were designed to run on these personal computers. Uh, originally, this was disk operating system, DOS, and so it was all kind of command line based, and then this kind of progressed to Windows applications after a while. And so, Again, keep in mind that the use of a computer for running distribution analysis has only been something we we've, we've kind of seen probably for like the last uh, you know 25 to 30 years or so. Before that, you know, everybody's just kind of doing approximations on you know using things like things like k-factor analysis. The other thing about distribution is that distribution circuits have a lot more elements, a lot more discrete elements than transmission. And when we're talking about distribution nowadays, a lot of times we model may almost down to the pole level, certainly down to the, the distribution transformer level. And so what this would mean is like in a distribution database for utility, it would have like tens of millions of elements in these databases because they're basically modeling all the way down to where the individual poles are located. Um, and so different utilities will have different criteria for how much detail they use. But a lot of times this is coming right out of a geographic information system and going right into uh, a computer analysis. All right. So these distribution programs, even though the circuits don't seem that complex, from a modeling standpoint, they're actually a lot more complex than, than transmission. So 
what do we want to do with these power flows once we have this capability? Well, the first thing, obviously, is to do voltage quality analysis. We talked about the fact that voltages have to stay within plus or minus 5% for um, acceptable service. And so this would be the big thing that distribution planners would be looking at would be, are the voltages within range? Or if not within range, then we look at things like adding voltage line regulators. Later on, we'll talk about capacitor banks. Uh, maybe if that's not sufficient, uh, we might even be looking at line upgrades. And so these are the different sort of things, you know, you would initially start with. Now, the other thing you'd be concerned with besides voltages is, are you going to have any overloads? Is something going to be getting overloaded to the point or you might be damaging, say, like a cable or an overhead line? And it's not feasible to go out there and measure all these values in the field. And so we rely on these computer programs, these, these power flow programs to tell us whether we're above the rated ampacity of these different elements. And so if we see we're gonna have some overloads and this is where we might have to upgrade a cable or a overhead line, we maybe convert one phase to two phase or convert two phase to three phase. If we have a small three phase wire, we might upgrade it to a higher size of wire. Uh, maybe we might have to upgrade, put larger transformers in. The other type of application now we're, we're seeing more and more of is to, to look at how well distributed energy resources are integrating in our circuit. And so it, a lot of times there would be an application that somebody wants to locate distribution, um, distributed energy resources at the distribution level. And so the, the planners would need to run studies around this and if there's going to be an issue, they'd have to determine how we're going to fix it, if that's possible. And then uh, another type of application would be, if you have an outage, how do you plan your restoration? And so if there's sections of circuit that have to be taken out, can we reroute power to serve customers uh, using like back feeds? And you have to make sure that when you're back feeding customers, that you don't create additional problems as far as overloads and voltage drops. And so there's actually real time um, power flow programs you can run, which you get data from the field and you can use this for coming up with a switching sequence for how you can restore customers. There's lots of other applications of, of a power flow program. This is kind of the core in a lot of other types of um, applications that we might want to use for analysis. But these are just kind of some of the main examples here. There's a lot of commercial products out there, and I'm not going to go through all these in detail. Probably for large investor-owned utilities in the United States, uh, SIME, SIME Dist is probably one of the main programs that get used. For a lot of the smaller utilities, like cooperatives and city utilities, you would see the Millsoft Windmill program being used. And then all these other programs are available. Um, one that gets used by a lot of utilities because it's used for protection as Aspen One Liner. We'll be using another program in class called OpenDSS, which is going to enable us to use um, a more complex type of distribution analysis. But there's a lot of different sort of programs out there that are set up for utility circuits. If you're working in the industrial space, there's, there's a different class of programs out there. Probably one of the more popular programs is a program called ETAP. Uh, another program is called SKM. Power Analytics is another program. Um, there's other programs out there as well in the international market, but these are the ones I've seen more of for the, for the U.S. market. So what these programs do is they enable you to not only run the power flow, but visualize the results. In these distribution circuits, there's, they have a geographic sort of layout because these these feeders follow most of the major roads. And so here's an example where you would have a substation and you have a, some main feeder coming out, which is three phase. And then you have a number of different laterals off of your main feeders. And then what you could do when you run the power flow is you can color code this to show like whether you're getting low versus high values or what's the relative loading, different things like that. So that makes it kind of convenient to, to have like a Windows sort of screen for seeing this.
This is the program we're using in class, the windmill program. You could see that you also see geography. It, it probably doesn't have as many bells and whistles as a program like SIMDIS, but it's, it's usually pretty good as far as just the analysis that you need. Maybe it doesn't have all the graphics functionality, but actually it has a pretty complete set of applications Whereas in SIME, you usually have to buy a lot of add-on extensions or they, they charge extra money for that. And what we have to feed in then is we have to feed in all this element information. This is what we've been talking about in class when we've been talking about the modeling of transformers and feeders. So what you see here is you see a, an example of a table which would make up a database for MillSoft circuit. Basically, what a circuit file has is it has these various types of equipment tables that contain all the needed information. And so, for example, one thing we've been talking about is we've been talking about if you have like um, line elements that you need to know for each phase, like what's the wire size, and you can kind of see you've got the various wire sizes on here. You would have a wire size for the neutral. You would have to have a length. You have to have a construction. The construction information would be in a separate table. Details in each of these conductors would be in a separate table. But you'd have a hierarchical set of tables, which would contain all this information. Uh, you'll have similar tables for capacitors and generators and sources and switches and all the other devices in a circuit. If you would then dig into the conductor parameters, then you would see things like what's the impacity or what's the resistance as a function of temperature, what's the GMR, or what's the diameter. You need all this information for doing the, the calculations to get the impedance. So all this is stored into tables. And then if you want to dig into more what are the other tables in a program like MillSoft, then if you go up to EQDB and you pull down this menu, you basically see you can get all the data on overhead or underground or different construction types or different transformers or different regulators. This is all stored in a series of tables. And you might want to take some time to look at these different sort of tables. And so if you were to give me all these tables, then basically that's a complete description of a circuit. Instead of having the file, if I had all these different tables, I could basically create the same model. In fact, for the results of the project, I'll ask you to dump these tables out because by looking through the tables very quickly, I can tell whether you built the circuit properly. So load data, uh, when we're talking about modeling the loads, there's a couple different ways we can do this. If, if you have a circuit, uh, a lot of times what, the way we think about this is you would have a node and then you'd have a maybe like an overhead element. It has a name, you have another node. Maybe you have another line element here. Maybe this is overhead two to three, then you have another node here. What you can do, you can, you can model load in a couple different ways. One would be you could add a, like a consumer device here. You can add a standalone load. And I'll do this a lot in the examples. The other thing you can do too, if you didn't want to go through all the trouble of, of creating these separate consumer nodes, is you can actually put load into a line segment. And so some utilities, if they want to just do something really quick and not have too much detail, they actually put the load in with the lines. And the reason you could do this is a lot of these circuits are radial. So what you would have is you, if you wanted to have your load associate with node two and you want to put that data in overhead one, two, well, any load that's at the end of the line, you can actually put this data right into the line element. And we'll, we'll see, like, we'll see this later on. I, I tend to want to keep it separate, but some utilities would actually just incorporate the load right into the line data. I think that you lose some flexibility that way, but some utilities might do that. We tend to break load into load classes. And so maybe residential, commercial, industrial. Millsoft, let the windmill program lets you define what these classifications are. And then we have to have a basis for the amount of load. You know, how do we determine P and Q? Well, 
we're either going to have to get some kilowatt hour information, maybe from the monthly bill, maybe you have some information about the size of the motors, if it's commercial industrial, we might actually have measurements we could plug in. We may use some information about the size of the transformer and some information about the number of customers. All this information can be used to derive load information. The reason we need this is because we would typically never have um, profile information from small customers. Now, maybe a big industrial customer, a big commercial customer might have a sophisticated meter, which gives you load profiles a function of time of day. But a small um, meter that we would use at a residential customer, maybe at best, if it's a smart meter, we get 15 minute energy readings. So we don't know like at peak loading conditions, exactly what KW and KBAR are. And so in order to sync that up to um, come up with a model that syncs up with our top of feeder measurements, you know, we have to have some different techniques, which I'll refer to as load allocation. And then this kilowatt hour information, we could, we can feed that in from a customer information system if we want to keep that updated. So in the Millsoft program, and this is similar to other power flows, um, this kind of shows what the billing load information looks like. Uh, in this case, we've got residential KW demand horsepower or the three different classes. Um, we could actually add more classes to this. We could modify this, but this is just what the default is. And you'll see that if we're talking about residential data, then we could have like KW KBAR format for this data. But a lot of times, more than likely, we're going to have either kilowatt hour billing data, some information about the number of customers, and some information about KVA, which kind of corresponds to the rating for the service, which a lot of times is kind of derived from the, from the transformer. Um, so anyway, we'll get into later on just a little bit, you know, exactly how we're going to use this data. But this information that we use for coming up with the, the load detail kind of starts from the billing load information in a program like Windmill. Okay, so before what we were doing is we were plugging values into the calculated load. And what I'm telling you that what we're actually going to be having to do is enter information into billing load. And from this billing load information, I'll get these calculated load values. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, these distribution computer analysis programs, they have a module referred to as load allocation. So the idea would be that if you have a substation and you're serving multiple feeders, each feeder would have a circuit breaker at the top with an associated relay. And that relay can take measurements. It could, it could actually take me measurements for kilowatts and K-bars. Okay, so if you've got a feeder and you've got all these transformers connected, and you have all these load points, I suppose this is um, section one load, section two, section three, section four. If I have a reading for the circuit, then how am I going to break that down um, such that I know what the load is here, 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 and here? Well, I use a load allocation process. And, and if I Let's start off by neglecting losses in the circuit. Let's suppose I know this measured load at the top of the circuit. Let's suppose, let's call this substation load. How am I going to break this down? Well, I need I need some load information. So let's suppose I knew for each of these different points what the energy was for like say each section. What I could do if I know what the total energy required by the circuit would be is I could proportion that using the ratio of the kilowatt hours consumed for each section divided by total kilowatt hours. You can see this is a unitless quantity right here. It's just simply a ratio. And so maybe, you know, that this measurement, it, it 
breaks this load down four ways, or maybe there's more load allocated to one section than another, because that section consumes more energy. So that's that's one index that we could use. And, and the neat thing about this, what this does, is if I'm running a model, I'm running a distribution power flow, I'm always using a net load that matches up with the field measurement. I may not know exactly what the load is at each of these different points, um, but usually it's going to be, you know, in the ballpark of what I need to get somewhat accurate results if I could use this sort of load allocation strategy. So we know by the time you get to the top of the feeder, everything matches up. Now, you could also take measurements further down the circuit. I mean, you could actually have a meter here at the, the midway point, and you could break this into two different parts if you want to. If it turns out that you had a, a measurement along here, you could factor in a real measurement as well. Um, but what you are going to need to have to do this is you're going to need to have a load allocation algorithm. Um, this shows what these top of feeder measurements may look like. Um, this shows what the real power profile is for a winter day. Um, if this is in the Carolinas, this is going to peak in the morning around 8 a.m. Um, this shows a summer profile, and this usually is going to be peaking out late afternoon, maybe between 5 and 6 p.m. And what we would do is we would normally get this data from the top of each feeder, maybe it'd be on a one or a five or a 15 minute basis. Now, what we're gonna focus on here, if, if we're gonna do a planning study, we usually focus on times where we get the peak stress on the circuit. So times where you'd have the peak stress in the circuit be winter time in the morning, summertime in the afternoon. A lot of times utilities will set up for two different study times. And when I run the power flow, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my worst case peak loading condition. I'm going to take this measurement and I'm going to allocate load on the circuit where when I sum up all the load, it's going to give me this value. And so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking at a, a peak stress condition on the circuit because I usually analyze my circuit for worst case conditions and make sure everything's going to be okay in the worst case. If the load's less than that, normally I'm okay because they have less voltage drop. So there's a lot of different ways we can do this allocation. Um, a lot of times this is going to be based on a topic feeder loading. We would have different sources of information for customer loads, depending on whether they have smart meter data or not. If all you had was transformer size, then a, a common method would be to allocate power to all the different load points based on the size of the transformer. The assumption would be if you have two times as large of a transformer, it's gonna be consuming two times as much real power, right? So what you would do is you would take off, you would take this top of feeder measurement. If you can run a power flow, you could subtract off the losses. If you had some other measurement points in the circuit you had values for, and we will call those spot loads, you could subtract that off. And then what you would do is you would allocate this real power measurement among all the other transformers in the circuit based on this ratio of an individual transformer KBA to the sum of the KBAs of all the other transformers that we want to do load allocation for. All right, so that would be a KBA based load allocation technique. Another way we can do this if we had just say like monthly billing data is we could do this allocation based on energy. So you would, again, you would take your top of feeder power measurement, you subtract off your existing measurements, subtract off your losses, and you would allocate based on say like a monthly measurement during your peak month um, in order to allocate that load. And so, this is actually built into this is actually built into power flow programs. They actually would have a separate load allocation module which does this allocation before you run the power flow. So here's a just a simple numerical example where I've got two measurements. Okay, I've got a measurement at the top of the feeder, 1.2 megawatts at power factor 0.9. I've got a spot load. This is where I have 
know the value. It's 400 kilowatts. And I've got two other transformers at locations A and C where I have a 1000 kVA transformer at A and I've got a 500 kVA transformer at C. So what I do is I got to allocate this 1200 kilowatts of load. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this type of feeder measurement. I've subtract off any spot load measurements I have. So it's I got to allocate 800 kW. I don't know where the 800 kilowatts is consumed at. And again, I'm going to neglect losses in this case. And so if I want to get the load for here, I take what's the kVA if I'm using kVA allocation, divide through by the sum of the the KVA values, which is 1,000 plus 500. And then what this gives me at point A is 533 kilowatts. Do something similar at C, I'm going to get 267 kilowatts. And if I add up 400 to 533 to 267, then that nets up to the 1.2 megawatts, um, assuming losses can be neglected. And so you have what's called a load allocation process or a program for doing this. So this shows in Millsoft kind of what the results of this analysis looks like. It's, it's based on running a power flow. And what you do is you would plug in your measurements at the top of the feeder. Now here, I've got the measurements by phase. So I had the measurements for phase A, B, and C, and I've got the power factors. I'm allocating, in this case, based on the KVA size of the transformers or the, the summation of the transformers, I should say, in this case. Uh, because this is kind of reduced down where I have multiple transformers kind of added together to give me like some equivalent loads. But you can see what we're getting is we're taking this set of measurements at the top of the feeder. We're taking the KVA sizes of the, the transformers at the various points in the circuit. And we're using this ratioing technique. And what we get is we get both the kilowatts and the K bar at each point. And you use a sim you do a similar technique that you use for KW to get the K bar. But anyway, this is how we get the calculated load values. You don't punch those in separately. You basically run this load allocation routine and it'll auto populate those calculated load entries. Um, something else you could do too at the bottom of the load allocation report, then you would see the, the net results and you could double check to, to make sure everything adds up okay. And then the neat thing about using this in Millsoft is it does this in an iterative way where it would take the losses into account. So it could actually take the losses into account in doing the load allocation. When you run voltage drop then, which we're gonna talk about next, um, when you run the voltage drop, then what you see for each different section in the circuit is you basically see um, what's going to be the actual primary voltage. So this is a 22.86 kV circuit. So line to neutral uh, is about 13 kV or so. Um, you could run this out on a 120 volt base. So see, you see on a 120 volt base, I got 124 volts at the top of the circuit. And then you could see things like what's the through amps on each section, you can see the kilowatt and the K bar. You can see power factor. You can see the losses in each section. And so distribution power flows have a different format than transmission power flows and sits in the radial. It does it on a section by section basis. So again, since we have our circuit and each line segment has its own end of line loading, then kind of what we're doing is we're kind of seeing all this sort of put together in one row entry. Oops. And then if you get to the if you get to the end of the power flow report, then it gives you like a summary, which we'll talk about later on, which talks about, you know, what's K bar associated with the the capacitors and the cable capacitance and what are the net losses and what are the low voltage points on the circuit and, and things like that. As far as the load modeling, we're going to start off by by looking at constant power loads, be similar to transmission um, in that respect. 
So we're going to be assuming that the real and reactive part of the load is going to be held fixed. But as I mentioned before, there's different types of load models. Uh, there's like a constant impedance model. We assume is that the resistance and reactance stays fixed. There's a constant current model, which we use for K factors. We assume the current stays constant. Uh, this is what's referred to as zip modeling, constant impedance, constant current, constant power. And you could actually ratio this out where you can have it like 30% Z, maybe 10% I, 60% P, something like that. You could, you could do that. And there's different reasons why we'd want to use these different types of models. Um, historically, utilities have tended to use constant power, but I'm seeing some utilities are adding a constant impedance to get a little bit more accurate um, impact of voltage change on load. And we'll talk later on more about why we wouldn't use a constant impedance model in class. All right. And then it, generically, then what this would look like again is you would have the, the constant power part of the load. And as voltage changed, then if you have a constant current component, then the real and reactive power adjusted by the change in voltage from nominal. Um, and then if you have a constant impedance part, then the change in voltage from nominal um, squared basically gives you the, the impact of of voltage on power consumption. And again, if you go into the Millsoft program, and you look at your load mix, you could actually change what do you want this, this breakdown to be. Um, if this would normally default to constant power, which is why you don't have a one in this first entry, but you know what you could have in here is you could have something like 0 0.5 and 0 0.3 and 0 0.2. It should all add up to it should all up to, up to one. All right, so um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna stop here for this video segment. In the next segment, I'm gonna start off by getting into the, how the power flow algorithm works. And before I get into the, for distribution, I just wanna kind of do a refresh on how we would do this calculation for transmission so you can see what the, the differences would be.